So my name's Jason Clark and I'm one of the designers of the Cineo stove jet. So I thought whilst we're waiting for the motor, it'd be a good thing to kind of sort of take one of these apart and just discuss the design. Um, so we can actually see what's involved and I can kind of talk through each of the parts, not just for you guys, but for me as well. It's a kind of good place to be. Uh, taken apart one of the stove fans and this is all the components which make up the product so the, the base is the first component which you assemble to so what makes us fundamentally different from the competition is that if you look underneath your stove fan it's got like this little spring and what that does as soon as it gets hot it lifts up and by lifting up you're essentially throttling the thermal energy which is what we don't want to do so what we want to do is we want to take that heat from from that surface which is kind of locked in so it's locked in heat that you've paid for and we want to get that heat from that stove surface into the room so what this heat block does essentially it acts like a sponge or a conduit so by putting that on top and by not lifting up we're soaking up that thermal energy and then pulling it into the tg which i'll talk about in a minute and then we're pushing that into the room so by not lifting up that's the better way to be, in my, in my thoughts. So, this is the, um, the TG, which is short for thermoelectric generator. And this is the heart of the product, the way I like to see it. This is what essentially makes this product possible, because the majority of TGs are very kind of low quality, low grade materials. The material get a bit geeky the material inside of it is called bism of telluride and what that is is like lots of tiny little cubes of material and um a person called thomas seabeck back in the, I think the 1800s discovered the phenomenon of what he called the seabeck effect which he named after his, himself and what it is is if you get two temperatures you get a hot and you get a cold if you get a big differential between hot and cold between the surfaces of the material well, that does it generates electrons which essentially is how this works but on a fundamental level no one still understands how this work works it's like gravity you know no one knows how that works yet so when i'm building a product like this i don't beat myself up too much because fundamentally no one understands how this product actually functions and works so getting back to the product the first thing that you do once you've got the heat block down is that you place the TEG on top and what that's doing is that's going to suck up the thermal energy through the material in, into this component. So the next stage once we've got the TEG down is to start building up the ducting. So this is the base ducting which essentially everything is going to fit to. So this slides into, into place. These are the key components which go between the hot and cold so what these do is like it's a material called mica which I'm fascinated about and this is a um, naturally occurring mineral so and then what this does is this acts as an insulation between hot and cold because even though we want the base hot we want the top bit as cold as possible so there's like a conflict of interest that we're trying to get this very hot and this very cold so what we do is we put the spacers onto the extension pieces, which then slide underneath the TEG. So the next component to go down is the heat sink. But before I start to sort of assemble this, I'd like to just talk about it a little bit because somebody suggested online that, well, why don't you just buy a computer heat sink and then just retrofit it? But the thing is with that is that you end up designing for that retrofit heat sink rather than creating a hierarchy of a hierarchy within the product itself because so for example the fixings might be in a different place the amount of copper might be a lot less the solder which is holding the heat sink to the copper might be a very low temperature solder and what we need is a high temperature solder because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the, the base as hot as possible but then the top bit we need as cold as possible so um that's that's one of the reasons is, is that if you do if you design up for, for a component which is off the shelf you're giving that too much weight and then that ends up driving the rest of the design rather than actually fun, changing the design from scratch and actually coming up with a component and making a cohesive package
hopefully that makes sense. Once the heat sink's in place, the next stage is to connect it all together. So we're using two M4 fixings that just drop through the hole from the top. One and then two. So what that does is that holds all the body together. Drop it in. So we get our own key and we lift up the base and then just slowly tighten it. Like that. And then do the same on the other side because you kind of want to get it to be evenly tightened. So just pull up, pull up both sides, then make sure they're in, it's sort of in line. So like what I'm doing is just lining them up. So when the main fixing goes through the body, you're not tightening them off centre. So and tighten either side. And then what it is, it's set, we have to use a special tool, which is a torque wrench. You probably guys probably already know, but this is set to 1.2 Newton meters either side and then it equates to um, 75 kilograms of force on the um, TEG itself which is quite a lot, it's incredible um, but hopefully one day we'll have this which comes with um, a 3D printer and um, essentially it's set to a specific torque to take the print head off which would be amazing to have this like special little tool but currently I've got to use this one and then I just wind it up and eventually what it'll do is it'll click so it's tight enough. It takes quite a lot. There we go, it does a little click noise, making sure it's all lined up and then do this side. A bit more. There we go, and it's clicked. I realised in the other video that I didn't show the um, the product to the camera, so well, that's it when it's all bolted together. So the next step is to assemble the motor to the bracket. So this is our bespoke motor that we've had manufactured. It's uh, just a sample at the minute. There's a few things wrong with it, like the shaft is too short and we've upgraded this plastic part on the back to be more resilient. So we've got better bearings front and back and we've got better brushes. This is because we're spinning a lot faster than your sort of conventional stove fan. So this fits to the motor bracket using M2.6 CSK fixings. This should, these should be M2.5, but as it goes, they're M2.6, which is quite annoying because you have to, you're forced into using this little Phillips screwdriver rather than an Allen key. For whatever reason, someone made the decision to go with that size. And there we have it. And then that is then fixed to the motor bracket. So what we do now is we attach the connector from the motor to the um, connector from the TG. So you've got to be, it's a little bit fiddly. So you've got to just kind of like, so I'll sort of show it like that. You've got to kind of just push it in and then hold it from both sides and it just like it's a little clip. And now we have it. So that's now attached to the power source, the motor. Um, so what I do then is tip it on its side so it's designed to balance so it can stand up so it makes it easy for assembly. So so we can essentially send it up like that, stand it up like that. And then we get these M4 fixings, put them through the back so we've made, made holes in the back to make it easy to assemble these then go through uh, one second then we get the allen key like that and then sort of tighten it so it's hand tight and then put the other one in it's got two fixings Give it a, make it so it's you know reasonably tight, not over tightened, but just so it's um, it's not going anywhere. But you can see from the top, so the fixing is designed to be exactly the right length, so you can see where it tightened up. Um, and there we have it. That's so we have the heat sink, and we have the motor, and that's all ready to go.
So now we've assembled the motor to the main body, the next bit is to put on the propeller. So this is our current propeller. And what, what makes our propeller different to the competition is essentially the pitch of the blade. So the more aggressive the pitch of the blade, the more airflow you move. But with the current fans, what you'll notice is that the pitch on the side of the blade, the bend essentially there, is very shallow. The reason it's shallow, again, comes back to, to the fundamental design of it standing up. Because it's standing up, it's essentially unbalanced, so it moves about. And if you put a very pitched blade on like this, the likelihood is that it'll vibrate even more. So that's one of the reasons why they don't pitch the blades like we do, because we're a lot more stable. So you slide the propeller onto the, um, the shaft. And then this is the tricky bit because currently the shaft is too short. So I'm having to kind of just put it on the edge, which isn't ideal. And that's obviously when we get the new motor that will solve that problem. So you can see it catch then, because you've got to be very, you've got to be just away from it. So let's try that. So there we go. All right, so we've got a nice clean propeller and it's spinning. So now everything's assembled, the last component to put on is the ducting. So, so this is a, a key component again, and there's a lot of science behind why you duct a fan. Um, I'm not going to get into everything because, to be honest, a lot of it's over my head and I refer to experts online when it comes to the reason why you would duct it. I just take that example and then apply it to this product. Um, I'm going to post some uh, comment to a video which is very good online so if you do want to learn about it just look into the comments or the information or the description and I will post a video from, from where one of my sources where I learned about ducting fans. So the last component goes over like this and just essentially slides over the entire assembly and then it's fixed with these M, with M5 fixings and then they go through the entire body, like that, either side. You sort of get, get it to hand tight, hand tighten it. I turn it around so you can kind of see when I'm doing it. But this is what gives the product its structure. So it's been held down through the TEG, but then it's also clamp together as a as a whole and then get the allen key it's a little bit tricky because i'm sort of not looking at it when i'm tightening it but the beauty of this is is that the, these fixings are also used for the manufacturing so they're used for putting the body together but they're also used to actually make and plate the product plate the individual components Right, and then once you get there, you just give it, make sure it's all lined up, give it a couple of turns. Not when that's tight enough, you don't need to over tighten things. And there we have it, an assembled product. So now we've got an assembled product, it only seemed right to actually put it on the hot plate to get it to spin. So there we go, so let's see how we go on. So it should, it's normally should start around like 30 to 40 degrees. Obviously that's pretty fast, you know, I, I, that's from cold. So I hope you enjoyed this video, I made it to the end and I'll send further updates in due course. Thank you very much, bye.